Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome, and thank you for joining us on this interesting, new, very relevant topic on uh, en environment, social and governance. Uh, I'd like to just uh, welcome you all and thank you for taking time out of your busy days to hear from myself and, and, and Greg on the call as well, for us to talk to you through, uh, through some slides. I just want to start um, just to remind everyone that, you know, the, the material that we're presenting today is our own personal opinions on this topic. We are not necessarily speaking on behalf of the IRM or on behalf of, of our employer. Just want to just do that here, little caveat at the beginning before we make a start. So as, as a quick introduction, just to introduce you all to uh, your, your host for today. So my name is Alex O'Brien. I'm a global uh, risk manager for a company based in the UAE and a uh, IRM committee member uh, within the UAE. And I'm joined by uh, Greg Allen, a regional sales director for a, for a, a leading software provider um, covering many components, which you'll you'll hear a bit more about a bit later on uh, during this presentation. Um, please do feel free to post comments in the chat box. Myself and, and Greg will be closely monitoring uh, monitoring the, the chat box. And of course, any questions at any point, please feel free to chip in and we'll do our best to get around to all your questions as soon as we can. And of course, at the very end, there will be a survey link for the chance for you to share feedback on how you felt today's presentation was, or your key learnings, and how uh, you know we can help moving forwards. So let's just make let's make a start then and touch on what are the exam questions that we want to answer today. We're going to touch on answering what is ESG. I'm sure you know all about it, but it doesn't help just have a bit of a recap about what this topic actually is. We're going to touch on what the ESG risk landscape looks like, so that you can actually conduct an ESG risk assessment. How could you and your organization add value in doing ESG risk activities? And then we'll touch on, uh, Greg will then touch on, you know, the noises hearing in the market about this topic and where technology can be an enabler to facilitate all of this process. So let's start at a really high level. Let's recap. What is ESG? In a few words, this is quite a nice statement or definition for what ESG is. A company's impact on society. Thinking about it from an environment, a social and a government and a governance perspective, straight and easy and easy to understand. How can a company do positive impacts on society? So where does it come from? Well, bit of a shock, but actually it's this whole concept started in the 1700s. ESG came about not directly, but through uh, organizations thinking about their code of conduct thinking about how religion, moral norms, and cultural values could be part of how an organization works. Over time, the 1980s, when that came about, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, um, the apartheid social in South Africa, the movement for divestment away from the horrors that were happening, and a lot of pressure from organizations, from global players to embrace people. Then in the early 90s, even more movement happened on this whole sustainability topic. There was the emergence of the three Ps, where actually organizations were starting to think not just about the profits, but actually start thinking about people, start thinking about the planet. How can they do good in the world rather than just making money? The UN, they introduced the Convention on Climate Change, a great progress to help organizations do more positive impacts in the world. Then in the 2000s, the UN Global Compact was launched. Ten principles covering human rights, labour, the environment, anti-corruption, all were introduced for organisations to start thinking differently about not just making money, but doing good in the world, being a positive impact on society. And then in the more recent years, ESG just became a massive uh, mainstream topic that everyone was talking about. In 2015, the Sustainable Development Goals were launched. 17 goals that were launched by the UN to help companies and people think about how we can do good in the world, not just about making profits. In 2021, the Sustainable Financial Disclosure Regulation came on board. Again, it's always been talk it's being talked about more and more. But I want us to today to focus on not what the market requires, but actually focus on how a company can be doing good in the first instance, and then a byproduct being pleasing uh, external parties. 
CSR or ESG is a question that does occasionally pop up, you know, about what's the difference. The reality is one evolved from the other. What was being called CSR a couple of years ago is now being seen as ESG. But ultimately, they're different ways of measuring the same thing, a company's impact on society. Some people say CSR was the internal initiative to fulfill a corporate purpose. Some people define ESG as an organization's external impact. So again, much broader reaching about what the company's impact on society is. There are two quotes I wanted to share with you before we get into the details about what an ESG risk assessment could look like. And these are quotes that actually really resonate really well with me for why this is important. And this is a quote that we have, I've overheard from investors. ESG or sustainability isn't demonstrated and measured based on how a company spends its profits. The focus has actually shifted more into asking whether they are generating revenue in a sustainable, ethical manner. So a big shift from not spending profits, but how can we make money in a sustainable manner? Another nice quote, even more to the point, it's not just about the 5% of your money that you give away that matters. It's what you do with the other 95% that's almost more important. So if we think about the reactive behavior is how you spend your profits, the proactive behavior is how you can show good during the revenue debt generation activities. I know you've seen it all before, but there's so much noise going on and there's more and more market drivers for why ESG is important. There are, there are the sustainable development goals, there's the inequality driving activism, there's the climate change driving corporate strategy, focusing on all the various components of ESG, there's so many regulations coming on board for what companies need to be disclosing to the markets. And this bottom table that is from crystalfund.com is quite a good illustration of what was being seen a couple of years ago and is already coming to fruition. Investors aren't prepared to spend any money on organizations unless they can demonstrate their ESG goals and commitments. But that's not why we're here today. We're not here to talk about doing ESG because external markets want us to be doing it. We're here today to talk about how we can use ESG as a tool to help you as an organization do good and be seen to be a good corporate citizen. So let's look at it at a very high level. The ESG risk landscape. There is the environmental components around how do we protect the environment and how could the environment change us as an organization. There is the social considerations. Are we doing the right thing for our people? And are we doing the right thing for others in the community? And then the governance part, which is always more tricky to understand than finding from people for quite a valid reason. But this is all around, are we operating in an appropriate ethical manner? And are we demonstrating appropriate values? On the call today, I believe we've got many risk practitioners, audit practitioners, people from compliance. This is a very important topic that we all need to properly and consistently understand. And we need to be doing ESG risk assessments to drive change. As an organization, we all want to be doing good by the world, be, seem to be a good corporate citizen. So what could stop us from doing that? Well, these ESG components and pillars provide a very good uh, framework for how to do an ESG risk assessment. And what I'm going to do over the next few slides is talk about, in each of these areas, I'm going to break them down for key areas you can think about and how you could conduct a risk assessment over the ESG topic. Of course, at any point, feel free to use the chat box to provide your questions and we'll keep an eye on answer as and when we see as an appropriate time. So let's start with the environment. Are we protecting the environment? And what are the risks that we should be thinking about when conducting this ESG risk assessment? These to me, I think are eight pretty useful, clear topics to consideration. Let's start with the first one, emissions. How is our company addressing emissions? Are we focusing too much? Are we, is our emissions rate increasing too much? Are the stats telling us that we're doing too much harm to the environment? Uh, is there too much emissions going on? What is the risk exposure for us? What are those key controls that we can implement to reduce our emissions? The energy consumption. Are we using too much energy? Are we using more than we need to? 
Do we understand how much energy we are actually consuming? Who, we, who in the market is asking questions about that? If no one is, why can't we use energy consumption as a metric to show good in the world? If we are improving, then why, well, how can we demonstrate that? Biodiversification. Are we just relying on fossil fuels? Or actually, can we start utilizing other forms of cleaner energy? If we can, fantastic. And we can advertise this to the market. We can be seen to be a good corporate citizen by doing more biodiversification. Extreme weather. The reality is climate change is happening and it is impacting all of us and us as an organization. But just how much is it? Doesn't matter what type of organization that we are, whether we are manufacturing, whether we're service industry, this is the, the climate change is going to impact us as a business. Are we resilient enough? What procedures have we got in place to ensure that we can continue operating in 2050 when there's higher winds, when there's higher temperatures, more extreme weathers? These could impact us, and we need to be thinking about how we can mitigate now to protect for the future. But then our, our emissions is not just all around carbon emissions, fossil fuels. What about our waste management, our effluent management? How are we utilizing, sorry, not utilizing, how are we recycling? How are we um, trying to make the most from our waste? How can we reduce our waste and the waste that we do generate? How can that be used sustainably? What other me methods are out there? Do we need to start spending a bit more money to be more sustainable in reducing our waste? Let's find out. During your ESG risk assessment, ask the questions to those key people and whether our higher exposures, flag it. That can then be reported to senior management as a way in which we can spend our money to improve our impact on society. Incident management. There will be environmental incidents to happen in an organisation. Again, it doesn't matter what industry we work in, if there, are in, if there are incidents, could that result in harm and damage to the environment? What do we need to do to be able to prevent and respond when there are those incidents that do occur? Then from an environmental regulation perspective, this is just taking off. Whether you are based just in the UAE or in the region or across the globe, so many locations are introducing regulation focused on environment, focused on carbon reduction, focused on waste management, focused on making sure that we are protecting the environment for the future. But do we actually understand what all those regulations are? Do, other, do people in the organisation understand what this means? Do the SMEs truly know what regulation we need to comply to? I'm sure the reality is that the answer to that is probably no. Not everyone does. So as part of this ESG risk assessment, when we speak to all of our various departments, we can ask the question, find out the answers and make change to do good on society. I've seen also a question in the chat box. Of course, yes, after this uh, presentation, the slides will be shared uh, in, in due course as well. And the final point I want to touch on from the environment before we move on is environmentally friendly supply chains, upstream and downstream. A company's measure for the environmental footprints and carbon footprints is no longer based on your own four walls. If you're using third parties, their environmental metrics impacts you as a business. You want to be seen to only engage with sustainable, reliable third parties. We are seeing it more and more. Many companies across the globe are actually opting to pay more to utilize more sustainable third parties downstream so that their own metrics don't get impacted. And then also upstream as well. Okay, we're making lots of money from particular customers, but if they aren't very environmentally friendly, if they're not very sustainable, do we want to actually be getting in bed with these customers or could we be generating our money in a more ethical, environmentally friendly manner? These are all important questions that us as risk and compliance and audit professionals, we need to understand and evaluate so that we can make that informed decision about whether our ESG footprint is where we want it to be. So those are the four, those are the, the eight high level environmental considerations. I'm now going to move on to social. Are we protecting our people and communities? What do I think of those seven or eight key risks? 
here are the thematic areas that I think are appropriate. And I'm going to start actually at the very end. Community engagement and support. This effectively what CSR was all about until a couple of years ago. But actually, when we talked earlier about the broader impact on society, ESG has evolved so much more. Not just thinking about community engagement, but thinking about all these other components as well. Let's start at the very top. Employee learning and development. We are committed to doing a positive impact on society. That includes our own people. Are we giving our own people opportunities to learn, to develop, to improve their capabilities so that they can continue to progress within the company and continue to progress within society? If we are doing this, we can publicize this. We can advertise to the market that we are an organization that looks after its people. And that's good PR. That's, got, that's good kudos that we can, we can publicize and help generate revenue from, from being seen to be a good company that has a good impact on society. Diversification. Just how diverse are we as a company? And are we doing enough in this regard? Is it getting enough focus and attention? In the region, it's always a bigger challenge focusing on diversification, but the leading companies are doing it and there's no excuse why we can't. I'm not going to list off the various different components of diversification because there's, there's so many and every single one of them is just as important and I don't want to be accused of forgetting something that isn't important. But think about what diversification means to you as a company. What does your board think about? What does your leadership team think about when it comes to diversity? And then are we actually addressing all of those considerations? Occupational health and safety. Are we protecting our people? Are we giving them a safe environment to work in? They can, this can be an, a, uh, an office-based job. It can be a shipping-based job. It can be working in the airport. It could be anywhere. Are we focused on protecting our people, keeping them safe so that they can help do good in society and help the company succeed and operate? Labour standards and working conditions kind of linked to the last point. Do we provide a safe, enjoyable atmosphere for our people to work in? Are we giving them good conditions? Are we providing accommodation for our employees? If so, are we giving robust, sufficient, appropriate, friendly accommodation? Or could we be seen as providing poor working conditions? You know, the Qatar scandal. Yeah, the Qatar World Cup scandals and rumours that were going around is a great example where maybe not enough focus and attention was done on the working conditions of, of the people building the stadiums in Qatar. And the, the output for that was all sorts of negative publicity, which wasn't a good measure for what the organisation was trying to do. Labour relations. How many family uh, organisations do we have that are utilising unions? Do we operate in locations globally that have unions? If so, what is our relationship with those unions? Do we know what they want? Are we ticking their boxes to help them? As part of the ESG assessment, we can ask that question, find out the answers and determine what gaps need to be plugged. Security and protection. Are we protecting our people from external threats? Are we operating in a high risk environment? whether it's within the region or globally? Do we know what security protocols are in place to protect our people and keep them away from harm? And then finally on social is the community engagement and support. What are we doing with all of our money? What are we doing to try and help the local communities? Let's not just think about how we're donating to charities. Let's not think about how we're donating to local causes. Are we employing the local communities? Are we looking for local employees to work in our organisation? Are we supporting them in that regard? If so, fantastic. That demonstrates that we are looking after society. It's not just about how we spend our money, but it's also how we make it. Can we make money utilising local people rather than using people further away? How do we spend our profits is not the main focus all the time. And then we then move nicely on to the governance, which I know is always the harder one to think about when it comes to ESG, how you can actually measure and identify the key risks. But hopefully this slide will provide you a bit of a guidance. 
And I summarize this nice and easily in saying, are we operating as a business ethically? What do I mean by that? Well, these are the seven risk areas that I think are most relevant when considering um, the governance category. Let's start off human rights. Do we know our human rights exposure? Are we operating locally only or are we operating across the region within the Middle East or in Africa or the wider globe? Do we know what those human rights concerns, exposures are? What are we doing to mitigate it? What can we do to mitigate? Are we having the right public image? Maybe we believe we're looking after human rights, but maybe other people are thinking differently. As an organization, as an example, many companies in the UAE uh, will have employees living in accommodation that the, 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 the organization operates. Maybe the employees are asking the employer to look after their passports to keep it safe. All good and well, and a nice gesture and a good intention, but could that be perceived as an organization keeping hold of passports? That's very negative publicity that's been all over the media in recent years. Could that potentially be an image that we've got from trying to do the good thing that could be seen as us having human rights exposures? Are we doing the right thing on society? Bribery and corruption. What do we have in place to detect, to prevent, to respond to bribery and corruption? Do we have a whistleblowing hotline that's genuinely independent, that gives the chance for people to flag concerns? Modern slavery. How much of a problem is that? So actually, before I move on to modern slavery, if I go back to bribery and corruption, maybe we believe we're okay. But if we are a global organization, maybe there is legislation in other countries that we have to be thinking about. The UK ABC Anti-Bribery and Corruption Code of Conduct needs to be adhered to. So if there is an instance of bribery and corruption in country X, and that same company is based in the UK as well, it's, it's a global fine because of a bribery and corruption activity. So we need to think across the board, what are we doing to prevent detect and respond to potential bribery and corruption claims. Modern slavery, what are we doing in this regard? Do we have any potential concerns? Could we be seen as conducting slavery related activities? Maybe we believe we're doing okay, but maybe someone else could think differently. What are the mitigations that we can put in place? Board composition. This is a tricky one in the region, particularly when there, there are many family organizations. And generally speaking, it's the families that sit on the boards and run the organizations. But could that potentially be seen as the wrong governance practice? Could that be seen as not as ethical as we would like? Do we have appropriate diversification on the board? Do we have the right skill sets, the right backgrounds, the right nationalities? The full, the full uh, spectrum needs to be considered to determine whether our board could be seen to be appropriate and be seen to be doing good by society rather than just being seen as a, as a revenue-grabbing uh, revenue organisation. Corporate governance. Do we have sufficient corporate governance in place? Do we have policies and procedures that cover off all of our core activities so that we can provide guidance to our people in how to go about their daily business? Do we have appropriate structures in place? Are, are the boards meeting, meeting regularly to provide sufficient oversight to detect and respond to potential mishap? Sanctions, a very big topic at the moment, given the, uh, the Russia-Ukraine conflict that brought about all sorts of new sanctions into the global economy. Do we truly understand where we have these sanction uh, potential threats? Who are we engaging with in a company? Who are we engaging with as, as people? Could that be seen as, um, as breaching US sanctions, EU sanctions, local sanctions? That can impact our reputation. That can result in fines and penalties, ultimately resulting in us not being seen to be doing good in society. And the final point I'll touch on then is all around ethical supply chains. So what do I mean by this? Well, I touched on it earlier, but who are we engaging with? Where are we spending our money? And who are we making money from? And are these people or companies that we actually want to be seen doing business with? Yes, we could be making a lot more money from doing business with a particular company, but if they're engaging unethically, if there's bad reputation in the market about what they are doing, 
maybe we, maybe that's the wrong call for us as a company because we don't want to be seen to be engaging with uh, incorrect or inappropriate people. So at a high level, you know, there's seven, there's about 22, 23 risk category areas there that fit into this ESG risk assessments that can help you as a company determine whether you are doing good by society, doing good by your people, by the environment, by third parties. So if you were to use those eight, those 22 or so risk thematic areas, how could you then put all this together and develop your ESG risk assessments that I highly recommend you do? I, the company where I work, I have done this. Many of my um, peers and other organizations have built bespoke ESG risk assessments. It's not just around having that one ESG risk at the board or senior management level. It's not around having that sustainability, doing good planting trees initiative. That's not true ESG. This risk assessment helps you think about the broad spectrum of it. So how can you develop that ESG risk assessment? Let's have a little think about it. What could we do? Let's think about what are those priority ESG risks that we need to assess and monitor. Speak to your leadership team. Understand who is asking for the ESG risk insights and what are they wanting comfort over? How can we help other people answer their questions about whether we are seen as a good company? The third box there is then, you know, the ESG assessment is not a self-assessment only. It is not just around the first line, completing the assessment, giving you the results, and then saying, good, perfect, off we go. We need to understand what assurances we want to get over those submissions. If we are a company that have 10 or 15 or so operating entities, what oversight do we want to have to make sure that we validate those results so that we can speak to the markets and say we are good? The reality is risk, audit, compliance practitioners, you know, we are not the experts in everything. We may think we are when we do meetings, but we're not. Each of our companies have internal SMEs. We have policy owners get their support in determining what the appropriate risks are that need to be assessed. From that, you've then got the foundations of the ESG risk assessment ready to go, ready to launch for people to complete. But that's only half the story. You're gonna get results back and you need to do something with it. So what is a good robust analysis and reporting activity? Again, utilize those SMEs. Don't just review everything yourselves you don't know everything that's the reality of it let's utilize the smes the policy owners to review and validate those results leverage business data where required to support those to support the results maybe someone is doing a submission and they're doing a self-assessment is there any business data that tangibly can be associated with that me metric it could be safety incidents it could be carbon emissions Maybe there's data and statistics that show that uh, your carbon footprint is a lot higher than what you've self-assessed. Utilize that data so you can test and verify whether the answers are correct so that you have a proper perspective. Alex, just, just one quick one. Just got one question came in in terms of, is there a standard framework probably linked back to one of your original slides of the various ESG frameworks in place? Yeah, there's, there's all sorts of standards with regards to um, how you can report on ESG. I think that, that, to me, this is one of the areas where there isn't necessarily a be all and end all set approach for how you can conduct a risk assessment. But what you can do is reverse engineer all the various components that the reporting requirements are asking. So if you're speaking, if, you're, if, you're look, if we go back to one of the earlier slides and you look at all those various standards that are being required, they all say what data you need to disclose. Utilize that as a starting point. But what are the key risks that you need to identify when doing this assessment? There is not a one size fits all approach, unfortunately. This is my personal view on what I think are good risk areas to consider. But speak to your key stakeholders and understand what are the risks they think are appropriate in this space. Coming back to the slide, embrace change. Embrace the fact that there are gaps in your company that need to get addressed. Get the business bought in to accepting that there are potentially further work that we need to do. Think and work with them to develop those practical action plans so that we can do more. 
And then look, don't leave this on the shelf. Don't do a one-off ESG assessment and then say, perfect, job done, move on. Make sure that's still being discussed in management meetings. Make sure when your risk profile is being discussed at the board, at the audit committee, at the senior management level, make sure that it stays a regular topic. Those actions, keep an eye on them. Make sure that the owners are doing what they committed to do. And then finally, determine what you need to report on. All those various standards that we showed in the previous slide show various reporting requirements. Understand which ones we need to comply to as a company and make sure that at a bare minimum we are adhering to that. My purpose for today was talking about how, as a company, we can do the right thing by ESG and demonstrate to others that we are doing good on society, but utilize those other standards, utilize those reporting requirements to make sure that you tick off what they are expecting. And then also understand internally, understand externally from your customers and your vendors, the regulator, understand what they want to hear with regard to risk management on ESG. So that, that can be considered and be brought into a component um, in the ESG assessment. So to me, that is one structured way in which you can build an ESG risk assessment. Um, and I'd like to hand over to Greg now so he can then share with you what he's hearing and seeing in the market. So, Alex, there was just a couple of questions that just came through. I don't know if sure. you want to take, take, take those just before I, I kick off. Sure. Yep, so we've got a question from, or a from Ritesh. Applicability of ESG to the type of corporates, are there any guidelines? So look, if you are, um, if you are a, a finance organisation, there are all sorts of requirements and, and regulations now that you do need to adhere to. For the non-banking sector, there's more and more being introduced softly and slowly. Do startup companies need to take into consideration their growth years? I think that's a fair question. Uh, the, the reality is at the beginning of any company, there will be mistakes. There will be behaviours and activities that maybe shouldn't have happened. If you can spin that into a positive, though, and show your learnings, there's no problem with that. As long as you can demonstrate to people the messages that you want. Got a question from Annette. Alex, you frame your frame questions with we um, and are we trading people? Who is we? And if the board should be a good question. Yeah, that's a fair question. Basically, when I'm saying we, who is we? By we, I mean the company. The company that you work for needs to be thinking about that. Ultimately, you're right. It is the board that have the ultimate say in what our public uh, impression is going to be public view on what could we want to be doing in society. When I'm saying we, I'm thinking holistically. As a risk practitioner, how I can help my organization do good in society by looking through all these various components. How closely are HSC and ESG interlinked? I think it's a very fair comment. So when we, uh, at my organization, when we do our ESG risk assessments, we utilize probably 15 various different corporate functions and departments to evaluate whether we are covering off all the various components. And in the H, in, in the environment and the social, there are many safety related questions, health related questions, environment related questions. Through us doing this activity, we leveraged a lot of the work that uh, our group HSC department were already doing as a way of demonstrating that we were doing good on society, as a way of demonstrating that we were doing it. So I wouldn't say keep them separate, I'm all around enterprise risk management. So thinking holistically, breaking down any siloed behavior. Don't let everyone do their own particular thing. ESG is a, is a, is a nice umbrella banner to bring all these components together into one. Could you please advise how many people need to be engaged with one organization that ESG is covered properly? All your leaders. Everyone that, anyone that helps contribute to an organization, uh, in my view, is, has a say in whether we are addressing the ESG risks properly. You know, this is not just for the sustainability department or the sustainability champion to focus on and mitigate and address. Success will be whether all your various department leaders are taking this seriously and proactively providing an opinion and proactively providing information. I hope I've done my best to answer some of the questions there. Of course, feel free to reach out to me on, on LinkedIn or via email if you want to discuss anything further. And we'll do our best to formalise uh, all the various questions that have been have been answered. So with that, I'm going to have a bit of a breather and stop speaking and hand over to Greg, who's desperate to, to get cracking.
<laughs> Thank, thanks, Alex. Um, so yeah, that, what I'm going to do over the next next few slides is just give you a little bit of view of what I'm hearing in the marketplace when I'm chatting to risk and assurance leaders like your, like yourselves out there, and just share some of that some of that insight and some of that story, and maybe get you guys thinking about actually from the from the perspective of uh, of some of the ESG teams and some of the challenges that they're facing um, because often on occasions and I'm sure you'd say it doesn't. We often all sit in silos in, in a number of different organisations and not always harmonising all this together. Um, but, but certainly, I think there's a significant variation when I'm chatting to heads of risks, heads of org, heads of control, um, variations in how much each of these individuals are getting pulled in and already engaged with their ESG functions. I think Alex gave a, a fantastic overview of all of those different is, risk areas that, that are there to be explored. But as Alex rightly said, you can't do it on your own. You, you can't sit there in isolation. You need to use the expertise within the within the organisation to do that. And I think it's safe to say from what I'm seeing, definitely varied. Um, and that comes back the other way. Um, certainly, in general, the ESG leads are not always thinking about risk and controls connectivity themselves. They don't necessarily come from that background where risk isn't the first thought. Um, they are thinking about how are the organization pushing forward in each of these you know environmental sustainable or governance areas and all of these different metrics and data points that they're collecting so they need help they need guidance they need support um, to let them demonstrate and you help them of showing some of those data points they're connecting they're collecting the reliance on that going into the public domain there is a whole range of control activity that needs to sit underneath that and therefore a whole range of interlinked risks that we need to think about now regulation is starting to push this into the public domain more and more and i don't know about you you, you know you can't move on linkedin or the press without esg and sustainability um, elements being top of the top of the agenda and look for esg teams that concept is is brand new and i think most of them are now having a bit of a shock where if we think about our finance related all the parts of the organization who are used to dealing in risk management used to dealing in insurance used to dealing in controls there's some help and guidance needed for our uh, esg and sustainability colleagues um so just moving that over then in terms of what does this what does this world look like now um certainly you know i think we as risk functions and um, heads of audit heads of risk have been used to that combination of grc and financial reporting so that green and yellow blob there on the on the screen and as we know all of that's surrounded by complexity in terms of various data flows that go through that we've almost now thrown petrol on the fire of bringing esg and sustainability into that mix and now we need to start thinking holistically of how we can think about managing and identifying those risks for all of our financial reporting side of things but as well as our non-financial reporting capability and as alex said you as risk functions want to have that ability to focus on those risk categories but some of the more basic challenges where we're seeing organizations face is just even on those simple levels of the data collection so whilst you've got some headline risks going on out there that are absolutely critical there are some very detailed operational risks where organizations are struggling just on the basic principles of collecting that data all the way through to then that ability to report on that. And again, these are the things that, that we can help, we can guide and utilize our experience, but trying to, to bring that information together. And ultimately, technology then plays a key factor in enabling you to, to actually drive some of that, some of that process and bring that together. Um, just going on then um, in terms of what does that feel like from a, an ESG and sustainability part of the business now? Um, again, just to bring this to life a little bit, they are facing a number of different factors that they're trying to deal with. Um, ultimately, look, everything from capturing their disclosure requirements, they're having to do some attestations potentially, they've got their own overall ESG report that they need to, need to pull together, they've got to think about internal board reporting, and look, for the first time, greater visibility is being focused on that ESG reporting datability and the collection of that. So from a risk perspective, we also need to be thinking and supporting them. Think about all those risk dynamics that are coming in from data collection all the way through to reporting. Because if we can manage some of those internal risks on making it happen, 
as a business, we can keep our attention where we want to on those bigger risks that Alex talked about in terms of those, those 22 to 23 categories of risk from that perspective. Um, just going in then to some of those, some of those challenges. Um, look, what are some of those, and you know, you can convert these into, into risks as well. Some of the challenges that, that, that we're seeing, um, you know, I think there is a lack of global alignment often in, in organizations. What, what goes on in one country can be vastly different in others, and that could be regulatory driver, that could be maturity of the company. Um, but this is um, essentially emphasized when often you look at those siloed natures, when you've got finance functions, audit functions, ESG functions, sustainability functions, and risk functions, not always aligned, not always communicating effectively from, from that perspective. And look, and then there are some, you know, there are some public things in the, in the domain when you think about greenwashing, um, and we talk about greenwashing is where organizations are presenting themselves as doing very green activities in their marketing, but that is not underpinned by the data that goes along with that. And again, now more than ever, organizations are going to get significant fines and essentially investor backlash um, if, this is the, if this is the case. So there are some significant risks to manage from that perspective. And certainly from a, a Workiva um, survey that we did of ESG leaders, the bit that they're most uncomfortable on is 72% of them don't have confidence in the data that's coming through. And ultimately, if you're reporting this data into the market, you want to be confident on the data that you're putting out with, as well as we, you know, as we would do with our financial data. So this is a journey that organizations are now starting to, starting to go through. And then if we think about that, just moving, moving on from a, from a GRC um, landscape perspective, Again, as a function, this means this is all now coming from our perspective as well. So we are looking at this from a risk perspective, the interconnectivity from our ESG activities, from our finance activities, from our operations in the business. We are thinking about this from an assurance overlay. How are we getting assurance over those controls that are um, in place to ensure that data quality is in place? How does that link in? How does that link into managing assurance over some of those key risks around that ESG that Alex talked about when internal audit plans are being, are being generated? With any new area um, and regulation, there's a whole range of policy that will sit alongside those EXG activities. And then, as you said in a minute, those overall headline underlying controls, and therefore that assurance activity. So look, our overall GRC landscape is continually evolving, is getting more complex, and the data flows that go between all of those activities um, is beginning to be a, a challenge for all organizations um, to, to manage that. So just in terms of moving that, moving out on then, in terms of what does that look like? What are we seeing um, the, the best risks teams do? Ultimately, trying to put in and utilize technology to help make this easier. If we can help make some of that data flow, some of that assurance activity easier, more transparent and easier for the business to engage, then we can focus our time and attention on actually proactively taking action, proactively managing the risks in itself. So take away some of the manual burden and then proactively get on to, to managing the risks. And, and that can be everything from facilitating, facilitating that end-to-end -end enterprise risk management, um, risk identification through to assessment, or that underpinning controls and assurance activity that under, underpins that. So the conversations I'm having with organisations going, look, actually, technology is no longer really a should I have, but it's becoming more of a must have driver because of that increased complexity in the landscape that we're all facing as, as risk functions. And then how, how are we you know, seeing, that, seeing that addressed? Um, if we, we go on to the, the next one, Alex, um, and then ultimately how are, we, how are we seeing that addressed? Ultimately, we're seeing that all to come together in the ability to have a single platform where you can bring this, bring this together. So the conversations I'm having with organizations going, well, look, why don't you start thinking when you're looking at technology, when you're looking at technology options, make sure you're thinking about that interlinkage between your GRC, ex ex <laughs> yes, absolutely. <Thank> you. <laughs> um, it, and it is, it really is. Trying to do this in Excel spreadsheets, trying to do this in Microsoft Office, I, you know, you often wonder whether, um, whether Bill Gates realized he was the, he's the leading GRC provider in the, in the market um, from that perspective, but look, just trying to make that life, um, reduce that manual activity, reduce that manual burden that you're doing and start connecting GRC activity 
we're already starting, we've already had historically connected it from a financial reporting perspective because that's been the focus. But how do we now bring in ESG to that activity, building on that journey that Alex just, just took us from, from that perspective? Um, so look, hopefully that gave you a, a little bit of an oversight of some of the challenges that, that I'm getting raised. Certainly, I think I'd encourage you all, if you haven't done already, get speaking to your ESG teams, um, get having that conversation. As Alex said, this is not something you can do on your own. Get out there speaking to all of the different directors across your, across your business, get them involved, get them engaged, but start thinking technology in, a, in an early part of that journey because the earlier you start thinking about it, will reduce some of that burden of the administration that goes on as you start to expand out across the different areas of, across the across the organisation. I think just to add to that as well, Greg, is um, around, I'm sure many people will be thinking internally in their company about who is that ESG department or person. And I'm sure a lot of the companies in the UAE don't actually have anyone properly looking after it. Maybe it's falling on someone as a part-time activity. That's not good. That's not right. Challenge the stakeholders, challenge management team to make sure ESG is being properly looked at. Because I would bet a lot of money that there's not many companies in the UAE that are truly thinking about this other than planting trees or doing beach cleanups. That's not ESG. That is one twentieth of what my view of ESG is. You know, so if you don't know who to speak to, perfect. There's the gap. Flag to the CEO, flag to your leadership team, that there is a massive gap in your organization on a topic that will be a, a problem for you in the future. Your customers will ask you about all the various ESG components. Your vendors will ask you about this because you are giving them money. They have to be demonstrating ESG values. The regulation is coming hugely in the EU on many components of ESG. It's going to come to the Middle East in no time at all, as we want to be a forefront leading area of the world. Get in early. If you are a startup company, demonstrate your values early on. It's a fantastic measure. It's a fantastic message to say to the market that you are doing wonderful things for the environment, wonderful things for society, and you are seen to be a truly ethical company. Get those companies. I've seen the comment here, you know, look forward to a session on ESG governance. ESG committees is a great shout. I'm sure companies have a health and safety committee. I'm sure companies have a charity committee of some sort. Make it an ESG committee. Cover all the components. Hammer it home. Get it right. And as Greg said, get the technology ready from the get-go. Don't wait until you've got various Excel documents ready to go and you want to pull together because it'll, be it'll be a nightmare for you. Get in early. Get the technology to help you. And you can only do uh, wonderful things. Um, I've got a few few questions few questions coming through. I think um, yes, are there are there global regulations? Yes, abs absolutely. Um, such as CSRD, that the regulations are coming and changing all of the time. Um, so they vary for, through different regions across the globe. But there are there are lots of ESG regulations out there to, to have a look at. As and Alex pulled up some of those on that original slide that you pulled through. Um, <laughs> Why organisations continue to, to agree with that? It's a very good question. And, and look, I think, I think this comes back to Alex's point that he was just making there. I think it's taking it seriously. I think to, uh, for the, throughout the history of life, I think organisations haven't taken this seriously. And this is no longer a nice to have. This is a must have now, because this is now just a baseline expectation from investors, from the market, as Alex said, from your suppliers. So they'll no longer get away with it. And the fines and the regulatory change along are going are to support that. Um, from that perspective, um, just scanning down to the others. Okay, I think that was that was the, the key ones. But yeah, I, as Alex said, I think just remembering this is this is not a nice to have anymore. Encourage you to get out, ask the questions, ask the questions of your executives um, to really make put this as an agenda point um, because this will make a massive difference going forward. These are the things that are going to make the headlines going forward over the next over the coming years. You know, financial financial reporting failings and fraud and things. Yes, they will, but the ESG, failing on your ESG data and doing things like that greenwashing are the things that are going to cause major, major challenges to, to organisations in the future in their public domain, their reputation, and ultimately their place in the market. Yeah. And look, just, um, oh, sorry, let me just uh, mute that, that one there. Um, I think one thing that I'm reflecting on my personal experience in conducting our, our ESG assessment, you know, we're, we're a big global organisation, um, 
you know, we got a lot of wows from people about the questions that we were asking to corporate functions. You know, we were approaching the people department, asking them challenging questions about people risk topics that they thought they were dealing with and they thought they had a good understanding of. But when we then dove a bit deeper to ask a few more questions about demonstrating what you believe is the case, that was them and there was the expectation gap. They thought they knew answers, but they didn't. And so actually us as a department, we've got huge kudos. You know, our enterprise risk team rocketed up in terms of reputation within our organization because we helped flag where we didn't know answers and helped them get the answers ready, ready for ESG reporting. You know, we, we as an organization are reporting to the market a whole report on it. You know, it's not just part of our annual reports and accounts. There was an ESG risk report from, from my employer. And through the work that we've done, we've helped provide credibility and assurances that the data and what we're saying is actually a correct um, a, a correct reality. So you, know, you can use it as a company to help do good in the environment, but also as risk practitioners, if you're seen to be making noise about this and you can demonstrate where the gaps are, you'll get that internal wealth factor as well. You'll get the internal praise and it will help your department gain the credibility as well. Uh, there was a question from Matesh. Could you kindly share standard ESG risk assessment frameworks or provide uh, some web links? So look, in the, the slides earlier, yeah, that, that, that touches on a number of frameworks and regulatory requirements. So you know, once these slides are shared, feel free to, you know, to search those, uh, those companies, uh, the, those regulations, um, and then you can, you can go, from, go from there. Is there a be all and end all set approach to how to do ESG? My view is no, there's not. There's various frameworks for how to report on what the standards require, but what is that appropriate approach to get there? I think there's still there's still more to come in this space for what is a standardized approach. The banks have got it nailed. There's established processes there because they have to. The non-banking sector, I think there's still some development. So us as risk practitioners, we can be at the forefront in developing what that looks like to meet those framework requirements. Good question. That what's what's the link between business continuity and ESG? It's one of the questions you can ask when you're going through each of those risks. You know what could result in a critical disruption that we have to prepare for. So the uh, the environmental emissions. Okay, have you thought about preparing for a crisis scenario? Maybe you as a company are being seen to be a more pollutant based company, less green, and there's rioting. The protests against you as a company. You're being seen in the media adversely, have you got a continuity plan? Have you got a crisis management plan to respond to that as a reactive behavior while you fix doing the right thing? ESG is talking about how your impact is on society or society can have an impact on you from a weather perspective because of the environment. Do your continuity plans truly think about what those changing scenarios could be? If you had power failure, what could happen? because of the environment. If you had unavailability of people or staff turnover because you weren't looking after people, what's your response? Are you utilize third parties and, and pay up? Or do you need to think about, um, you know, more think about the training and getting the right controls in the first instance? So look, to answer your question, it's, it's a good point. And there's definitely a link between us all. I think through the ESG assessment, you can figure out where your biggest disruption threats are and then develop appropriate um, procedures. And yeah, completely agree, Anita. Think people before profit. You know, think society in general before profit. You know, society means people, means the environment, means your stakeholders, it means, it means everyone. I think it's a, a, nice, uh, a nice summary statement to, to close this on. So look, with that, thank you very much for attending everyone. We hope you um, enjoyed it and hopefully you, you learned a few things for how you can take some good work back to your organization. Uh, I did post in the chat box a link to a survey. We would greatly appreciate if you could spare those two minutes to take a little look, share your feedback on what you enjoyed, what we'd like to see more of moving forward next time. Yeah, we always appreciate it. And yes, as, as mentioned many times, all the slides will be made available. There'll be this recording is available as well. Uh, so feel free to refer back to it. If you want to listen to my boring droning voice, feel free to listen to it again. And of course, at any time, you know, feel free to reach out to us, uh, both us personally, myself and Greg, or if you want to speak, reach out to the 
IRM committee for the UAE. Surab leads the, the chapter here, but I'm one of the committee members, and we're always interested to hear about what you want to hear about. I thought it was good to tell you guys about ESG. If there's a new topic that you think is relevant for us to discuss as a committee, please do reach out to us, and we will, of course, do whatever we can to help. So thank you, everybody. Have a great evening, and uh, we'll hopefully speak soon.